Jesus. And he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost, to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So, therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. You may be seated, and let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for your words that you give to us today. And harsh and hard words that they are. Help us find meaning and application to our lives to understand that you need to be the first priority in all things in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I like the story told of a young man who on his 16th birthday approached his father and asked, Dad, I'm 16 years old now. And when I get my license, can I drive the family car? And his dad looked at him and said, Well, son, driving a car takes a lot of maturity. And first, you must prove you are responsible enough. And one way you must do that is to bring up your grades in school. Secondly, you must begin to read your Bible every day. And finally, I want you to get a haircut. Your hair looks outrageous. Sounds like my mother. <laughs> well, the son began the task of fulfilling his father's requirements, knowing that dad slash request to get a haircut might be impossible. And when his grades came out, he came to his father with a big smile and he said, look dad, I got all the A's and B's in my report card. Now can I drive a family car? And the father replied, very good son, you're one third of the way there. But have you been reading your Bible every day? And his son replied, yes dad, I've been reading my Bible every day. And the father said, well, very good. Now you're two-thirds of the way there. Now, when are you going to get that haircut? And the son, thinking he could shortcut his father's requirements, tried to outsmart his father by saying back to him, Dad, I don't see why I need to get a haircut. After all, Jesus had long hair, didn't he? And the father looked at the son and said, you're right, he did. And that's why Jesus walked everywhere he went. <laughs> Explain it away, or perhaps 
attempt to reinterpret it to fit our daily lives. And that temptation, however, is just another symptom of the consumption and the consumerism that infects much of our society, our church, and our faith. Too often, church and faith are treated like a big buffet at those one-time Piccadilly cafeterias. You remember those? I think there's one or two left somewhere. We take as much of what we want and like, and then we leave behind what we don't like, what's too hard to swallow, what we disagree with, or what does not fit our personal daily needs and opinions. And that's how the gospel does not portray Jesus. That is not how the gospel portrays the life of discipleship. To the degree that we have done that, we have deceived ourselves and each other. Sometimes we need to have demands and expectations just like that father. And we know that good parents know that. Parents say to their children, eat your vegetables because it's good for you. Do the right thing. Study hard. Do your chores. Do your homework. Make good friends. They demand and expect out of love so that their child might grow and thrive. And that's what Jesus is doing in today's gospel, believe it or not. His expectations and demands call us to be different, to be fully alive, to be like him. And it is that same choice that Moses said before the Israelites told in our Old Testament lesson today. The choice between life and prosperity. The choice between death and adversity. It is a choice we make about a multitude of things every day in our lives. And that's the choice with which Jesus confronts the crowds in today's gospel. The crowds have been gathering around Jesus since early in his ministry. Jesus was the new buffet that opened in its doors in the neighboring towns. He offered bread, healing, exorcisms, teaching, hope, life, freedom, good news, and a new vision. He had what the people wanted. They gathered around and surrounded and waited in long lines to see him. They pressed in on him. It was as if they could not get enough of Jesus. The crowds grew in numbers, increasing by thousands. And something changes, however, in today's gospel. They are no longer just gathering when Jesus is around. They are now traveling with Jesus. But there is more to discipleship than traveling with Jesus. They learn discipleship is more than embracing at the neighborhood buffet on divine life. That life cannot be bought, but it will cost us everything we have. Hate your family and your own life. Carry the cross. Lift it high. Give up your possessions. And so you might ask, how did Jesus hate his own parents? Well, remember that story told a 12-year-old Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem? Mary and Joseph are frantic looking for him. He's gone missing, and and they think he's lost. And when they find him, Mary asks Jesus, Why have you treated us like this, son? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. And Jesus said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And in that moment, Jesus, you might say, hates Mary and Joseph, but not the kind of emotional hate that we sometimes think about today. And Aramaic, the word we translate as hate here, has nothing to do with emotion or that kind of hate. I feel hostile, perhaps you could say, towards another. For instance, if I say, I love Penn State, which I do because I went there, <laughs> and I hate Pitt, I don't really hate Pitt, but that's my choice. And so you see, Jesus is not rejecting his parents. He is establishing a new world order, new priorities. And for the disciple, no one and no relationship can take precedence over the relationship with Jesus. Not even a father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, or life itself. In that sense, Jesus hated his own life. He not only lifted the high the cross throughout his ministry, he carried the cross and gave precedence to his Father's will and our salvation. And he set aside his will and preferences in favor of love and obedience to God. Okay, you say, well, Pastor, that takes care of behaving your parents and the um, following cross, you know, the high cross of Christ that you talked about. But how about that business that Jesus is talking about giving up all my possessions and following me? 
where Jesus said the birds and the animals of this world have more possessions than Jesus. Remember how he said foxes have holes and birds have the air, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Again, Jesus is giving primacy to his relationship with God, not his relationship with other things. And again, it's a question of priorities. Jesus is asking us to do and be what he did and be who he was. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a learner, one who lives and acts and speaks and thinks like a teacher. The disciple integrates the teacher's life and the teachings into his or her own life. No one, no cause, no thing can take precedence over or interfere with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing is more important because it is our relationship with Jesus that shapes and defines and determines and characterizes all our other relationships. All the other aspects of our life, who we are, what we say, and what we do. Discipleship, learning to be and live like Jesus, is ultimately what unifies us. Think about it. Think about your life for a minute. So often we, we live fragmented and compartmentalized lives. We have our work life. We have our school life. We have our family life, our home life. Some of us have an internet life a recreational life, a gym life, working out, a political and civic life, a church life. And this fragmentation allows us to place each of those different aspects of our life as a priority at the moment, depending who we are with and what we are doing at the time. And that fragmentation is one more symptom of a consumer-oriented, buffet-driven world. Jesus demands and has expectations to change all that. There can only be one priority, and it is to inform and shape the whole of who we are and what we are and what we do. Think about for a moment about the implications of having only one priority in your life in terms of how that might inform and shape the whole person of your life. Think about it. It means we are to be the same person the same values, have the same principles and beliefs, regardless of where we are, who we are with, or what we are doing. That means politics is no longer governed by party agendas or loyalty, but by commitment to Jesus and gospel agendas. That means personal opinions and preferences give way to love of neighbor and one's enemies. Imagine how that one thing, that one number one priority of Jesus in our lives, Think how that would change the postings and comments on Facebook and other social media, as well as our private and our public conversations. It would mean business is not a capitalist venture to gain money, power to leverage over another, but a resource to care for and support and satisfy human needs. It would mean the environment is not a commodity to be used or polluted and stripped, but would be regarded as a sacred gift entrusted to our care, a gift that manifests and reveals God's own beauty and His holiness. And you know, Rob was going to come up here in a few minutes and talk about a retreat. Oh my gosh, think about how life would be different here at St. Mark's Lutheran Church if every one of you here, and those who are not here, would lift that high, high the cross of Christ and made Jesus your number one priority. And you followed Jesus. Let me tell you, life around here and in your life would totally change. Amen? Amen. Your life in this church would really reveal your life is ultimately a lesion to Jesus Christ. Of course, if we choose to live like that, there'll be costs and sacrifices to be made. And we shouldn't be surprised by that, should we? We know that's true for other parts of our lives. We sacrifice, year, sacrifice years of study for an education. We sacrifice long hours and weekends for a successful career. We sacrifice time and money and other opportunities to make sure that our kids go to camp, go to college, engage in activities and sports games. We sacrifice dessert for a healthy diet, and we sacrifice sleeping so that we can get up early and work out in the gym. And we know how to make sacrifices and to pay the cost. We do it because those things are important to us. They are priorities for us. 
And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. They are good and important aspects of our lives, but they cannot avoid the obvious question to which all that leads. What cost are you and I paying? What sacrifices are we willing to make to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I don't know what your answer is. The answer will be different for each one of us. But I'm sure each answer will involve reordering your priorities. Our learning is to be like Jesus is not just another priority among many. It is to be the priority. And it has its consequences for our relationships, our time, our money, our work, our energy, and our effort. No part of our life will be untouched when we make that choice. And if we want to know what our priority is, what orients and drives and directs our life, we need only look at the choices we make in life, what we choose to say and do, and the ways in which we spend our time and our money and our energy. What do those choices say about us? Do they reflect discipleship and learning to be like Jesus? What new choices might more closely align your life with Jesus? I think there's a good reason biblical scholars call today's gospel one of Jesus' quote-unquote hard sayings. It offers challenging words and raises difficult questions for each one of us. They are, however, words and questions that offer life. As we read in our Old Testament lesson today in prosperity. And isn't that why we showed up at St. Mark's this morning? We want life. We want to be fully alive. We want to be real. We want to be authentic. We want to be like Jesus. But please do not let today's gospel scare you away. Because we can do this. We can do that individually. And we can do that as a church. God has made that possible. And let's not lose the power and the gift of his words to us. Let's not lose this moment. Let's not even leave this church this morning as the same person that you came in here as this morning. What is one thing, just one thing, large or small, that you could do and give up that changes your priorities or reorders your relationships that gives precedence to Christ? I ask that you make that starting point today. Give up that one thing when you leave worship today, and then give up one or how many other things you need to that are necessary to follow Jesus and make him number one in your life and in your church. I guarantee you, you'll become a different person. St. Mark's will become a different church. Because when Jesus is your number one priority, when Jesus is our number one priority at St. Mark's, you will be choosing life. We will be choosing life. Choose life and prosperity. Choose life and prosperity. Today, now, and forevermore. And as God's people together, we say, Amen. Congregation, please stand. And may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Congregation, you may be seated. And the I'd like to invite you to come forward. To, um, share some exciting news about our plans for the coming year and our council retreat is asking.